When I wrote the master algorithm five years ago, one of my main motivations was that people were insufficiently aware of the issues surrounding AI. Fast forward to today, and the, and the good news is that people are highly aware of the issues, maybe almost too much. The bad news, however, is that on every one of these issues, there's a lot of misconceptions. And uh, people have tended to focus on the wrong things, which um, suck all the oxygen out of the room and actually prevent us from focusing on what I think are some of the bigger concerns. AI is a canvas uh, onto which we project our fears and preoccupations. And because of that, we tend to not see the real AI. We see AI not as it is, but as we are. So what I'd like to try to do in the next 20 minutes is uh, look at some of these issues, try to help dispel some of the misconceptions, and focus on, on where I think some of, the, you know, some of the real problems are. So starting with privacy. Uh, if you listen to the media and to a wide variety of cri critics, uh, we have a big problem in the world today, which is that evil companies are using our data to manipulate us. And foreign agents are using, uh, you know, the AI to manipulate our vote and, and whatnot. Here's a reality check, though. The, the value to, you know, the biggest users of this are companies like, you know, company in, uh, like Google and Facebook. And the revenue per user of companies like Google and Facebook is in the tens of dollars per year. Whereas the average expenditure of a user is in the tens of thousands of dollars per year. What this means is that, how you do the accounting exactly is not that important. What it means is that the impact of targeted advertising on what you do is still very small. Targeted advertising is actually still very ineffective. It's more effective than mass advertising, which is what makes it worthwhile, but it's still very far from being a big determiner of what you do. Think about it for a second. How often do you buy something because of a target ad that you see? Almost never, right? The biggest use of, of data and machine learning today is for personalization. And personalization is not a zero-sum game. The biggest beneficiary of personalization is you. Google gives different results to different people, and that is a good thing. Would it really be better if Google gave the, gave the same results to everybody? It would be terrible for diversity, among other things. Diversity needs data. Here's a second reality check. The current focus on privacy started with the, the data from Facebook that Cambridge Analytica effectively stole and, and used, uh, you know, supposedly to influence the election. Well, reality check. The data from Facebook that Cambridge Analytica have access to have no known effect on the election. Data scientists knew that Cambridge Analytica is actually not a very respectable operation. They made very you know, inflated claims that nobody actually took very seriously. So if you're looking for a culprit for the election of Trump in 2006, maybe one of the more traditional ones, like Fox News, would, would be a better target of your eye. So, however, in the meantime, right, as people, you know, and governments have become very, you know, conscious of privacy, regulations have started to happen. Including, for example, and, and, and you know, prominently in, in Europe with, with the General Data Protection Regulation, or GDPR for short, and in California. And these regulations, despite their good intentions, do a lot of harmful things. So, for example, one of the keystones of the GDPR is that data can only be used for the purpose that it was originally gathered for. This sounds benign enough, but it's a terrible idea. Because the magic of data is, is using it for purposes that it wasn't originally gathered for. If data could only be used for the purpose it was originally gathered for, we wouldn't have penicillin, and we wouldn't have x-rays. Data being used for new purposes is what drives the digital economy. Do we really want to strangle the digital economy in the cradle by making this impossible? Surely not. Here's another one, the right to explanation. Again, very well-intentioned thing, right? Explainability is good, but accuracy is also good, and there is a trade-off between the two. If I'm at risk of cancer, 
I would rather be diagnosed by a machine learning system that is 90% accurate and gives no explanations than by one that is 80% accurate and gives explanations. What would your choice be? Different people will make different choices. And there shouldn't be a single choice that is mandated by the government. The right to be forgotten. The right to be forgotten conflicts with the right to remember. We all have the right to remember, whether it's in our neurons or, or, or in our hard disks. And the right to be forgotten, among other things, causes private companies like Google to become the arbiters of what can be remembered and what can't. And then, of course, it also opens the door to censorship. And, you know, I could go on with this list, but I think the important thing to remember is the following, is that there's an assumption in a lot of these things that people care a lot about privacy. However, we know from studies that when, many studies, that when people have to make concrete trade-offs, the implied value of privacy is extremely low. And in particular, the younger generations care a lot less about privacy than the older ones. Both technology and society are evolving rapidly. We do not yet know how to regulate privacy, so we shouldn't rush into it. Here's another one, jobs. The AI jobs apocalypse is coming. You know, the Industrial Revolution automated, you know, muscle work, and once AI automates brain work, there will be nothing left for us humans to do. How worried should we be about this? Well, um, I mean, think about it. There's been, you know, there, there were papers, for example, that got a lot of attention saying, you know, some large percentage of jobs is at risk in the next decade or, or, or so. But when you actually dig down into it, and some you know, more recent and more careful papers look into this, and this has been alluded to today, a job is many tasks. And while some of these tasks are easy to automate, other, job, other tasks are not easy to automate. So, the first, so for the foreseeable future, what's going to happen for the most part is that not that AI does away with existing jobs, is that some parts of jobs will be automated and some won't. And as, the, you know, and as you know, Ajay and, and Josh and Avi you know, show very well in their book, Prediction Machines, what the main thing that AI does is lower the cost of prediction. And that increases the value, as always, in economics of the complements, in particular, the value of human judgment. So in some ways, what is happening with AI is actually enhancing the value of human work in many areas. 200 years ago, Almost everybody was a farmer. Today, in, develop, in the developed world, it's about 2%. And as you've probably noticed, 98% of us are not unemployed. We're actually doing a whole variety of jobs that people 200 years ago couldn't even imagine. Like, for example, app developer. So AI will create a lot of new kinds of jobs. It's harder to picture those than the ones that disappear but, you know, we, we know that it's been happening so far, and we can also see how it's going to happen in the future. What we really need to do is figure out how to use AI in our jobs better. Now, here's another important aspect of this. AI will also create new jobs in existing categories. People talk, for example, about, you know, truck drivers losing their jobs. If trucking is automated, the cost of goods goes down. Because of that, people have more money in their pocket, and they spend it on other things, like, for example, a bigger house or eating out more. So we don't have to turn truck drivers into programmers. The truck, you know, like, the truck driver can then become a waiter or a construction worker. So overall, in the economy, lowering the cost of some things is actually, is, you know, it's, it's a net positive because it improves people's quality of life, and there will be jobs providing these other things. So I think it's important uh, when, when we think about jobs to um, remember there's the danger of the AI apocalypse, but there's also, at the same time, the productivity paradox. Right? It's ironic that economists worry about both the AI jobs apocalypse and the productivity paradox. The productivity paradox is that productivity is not going up like it used to. And, you know, you can't call it, you know, standards of living cannot improve if productivity does not improve. AI is the best quiver 
in our, you know, the best area in our quiver to, to improve productivity. So we should actually try to foster that as much as possible. We, we, need, we, need, you know, we, we need automation to, among other things, support an aging society. Right? Society is aging steadily. You know, in, in, you know, in you know, most countries in the world, and, you know, but, and pretty soon pretty much every country in the world, we need automation just to maintain our current standards of living. So the real danger, I think, is not that AI is going to take all our jobs, is that AI will not happen soon enough. So fairness. Machine learning algorithms, these days, if you read the media, and, you know, there were just a bunch of examples of that in Aaron's talk, is almost synonymous with bias and discrimination. There's all, you know, one example after another where machine learning has, you know, allegedly discriminated against some protected group or another. Well, here's the reality. A machine learning algorithm is mathematically incapable of being biased. Think of the equation y equals ax plus b. Is that equation biased by race or gender? Of course not. That's an absurd notion. But a machine learning algorithm is just a more complex form of equation. It's not any more capable of being biased. I think a lot of the problem is that there's a, in common usage, we elide the notion of a machine learning algorithm and they learn the model. A learned model is what you get as the output when you apply a machine learning algorithm to data. Now, the data could have biases. The cure for that is to have a representative sample, which is a very well-known and well-studied problem and has been for decades. The humans applying the machine learning algorithm could have biases. The cure for that is to have a, a, a well-designed protocol for doing the modeling and to have an audit trail. And hand-coded algorithms, of course, can have biases as well because they do whatever people program them to. But a machine learning algorithm that makes no prior assumptions about particular variables, by definition, does not have a bias. If somebody alleges that it has the bias, it's, there's something wrong with the definition of bias. Here's a famous example. The ProPublica study uh, on, on, on sentencing. The ProPublica journalists found that uh, you know, this algorithm used for sentencing produced more false positives among black defendants than among whites. This seems like an obvious example of racism. Well, actually, it's not, because it also produced more false negatives. And for a very simple reason, in, 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 in similar proportions, for the sim very simple reason that just the, the, the rate of recidivism is higher among blacks than among whites. And when you actually look at the curve of, of predicted, of, of, of score, of recidivism score, a natural probability of recidivism, it's almost completely unbiased. If anything, it's slightly biased against whites. And this is not a secret. The company that makes this, you know, published the report of the journalists, it's been studied by academics several times, but yet this continues to be cited widely as a glaring example of biased algorithms. And this is not the only example. I've seen one after another where when you look at it carefully, the claims of bias are dubious at best and you know, just plain wrong at worst. The reality is that, as a rule, algorithms are far less biased than humans. And using them is a great improvement. Danny Kahneman has a whole chapter in Thinking Fast and Slow, documenting how algorithms are less biased than humans. And many of these examples go back several decades. Credit scoring is a famous example. Thanks to credit scoring, many people, notably including minorities, have credit cards today that otherwise they wouldn't. Thanks to the use of machine learning in hiring, the hiring is less, in, for example, for things like screening vitas, the hiring is now less prone to a lot of the biases that humans bring into hiring. Thanks to the use of machine learning in predictive policing, a small police force can effectively do the job of a much larger one, including better protecting minority neighborhoods. 
In fact, what, what, what tends to happen, somewhat perversely, when we try to debias our algorithms by, for example, encoding notions of fairness into them, is that we make them biased. As Aaron alluded to, there's an inevitable trade-off between fairness and accuracy. And so when you try to make the algorithm fair, you actually make it less accurate. You are effectively distorting the world to make it more like what you would like it to be instead of what it really is, which I think is a dangerous thing to do. And moreover, there is no single notion of fairness. Different people will have different notions, and it's mathematically impossible to satisfy them all at once. So what, a private, so what a fairness researcher is effectively doing is embedding their own notion of fairness into the algorithm. And this is, again, it's very dangerous because you know, this, these algorithms are gonna be used and have real consequences. In particular, most fairness researchers are liberal, and when conservatives wake up to what is going on, they're going to be furious. They're gonna see this as another example of politicized science. And then, you know, the, the liberals are going to see this as another example of conservatives being anti-science. So AI risks turning into a political football with, you know, polarization and no progress, you know, like climate change. There's still time to avoid that. The job of a researcher is to carefully, scrupulously avoid embedding their own ideology into the algorithms. We should, because different people in different societies will have different ideologies and make different choices, our job is to provide the tools for people in societies to then decide how they want to use the algorithms. Time is getting short, so let me run quickly through the remaining ones. Another thing that we hear a lot of alarm about is how tech companies have become too powerful. Maybe they should be broken up or at least they need to be reined in. Uh, I think it's good to remind people that we, history shows us that companies that look like they're very dominant uh, you know, often lose their dominance even as the government is pursuing very costly antitrust cases against them. IBM, Microsoft, uh, you know, AT&T, et cetera. The tech companies of today are much more vulnerable than is commonly appreciated. Google and Facebook are vulnerable to ad blockers. Facebook is vulnerable to changing fashions and social networks. Amazon is vulnerable to Shopify. Apple is vulnerable to companies making you know, co you know, phones that are as good as the iPhone for a fraction of the cost. We actually have large technology companies continue to be born like Uber and Airbnb and, and, and uh, uh, Snap and so on. It's never been easier to do a startup with you know, things like uh, you know, open source software and, 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 and cloud computing. So let's be careful. We have to remember that because of the current climate, tech companies are already shying away from invading some industries that they should. Look at, look at healthcare, for example. Right? We want the tech companies to invade healthcare. They have the data and the, you know, and the AI chops to potentially improve outcomes and reduce costs, and we want that to happen. Now, um, the incumbents have a lot of advantages. Maybe they'll win in the end, but you know, we should let the competition happen because I think it'll be to everybody's benefit. Yeah. And there are a couple more, including Intelligent Weapons and Terminator. But since uh, time is up, I will stop here and just say the following. The most important thing to think about in AI is not, is in, in, in very much in agreement with the, with the, with the you know, with the, you know, the theme of the conference this year is who does it give power to and who does it take power from? And you should ask yourself how much of the AI in the world today answers to you? And I think the answer to that is not enough. So what we need to work on is making AI serve us all better than it does today. Thank you.